Hey traders, welcome to another global macro update. Like always, we're gonna be starting off with the S&P 500. This index is showing the 500 largest companies in the United States, and this is the daily chart, meaning that every chart indicates 24, or not 24 hours, but uh, a day's worth of trading. Whereas in this case, it is because it is the futures, but if you're trading uh, the actual index itself, it's obviously only trading for uh, when the market is open. So first things first, let's draw our little snip here and discuss what we've been seeing within the recent price action and the bullishness overall is still present in my personal view. We see that this previous early mid-June zone that we hit the high has been broken. We initially tested it back in kind of mid-July and then we tested it for a second time and then the momentum and the structures kept on pushing the price to the upside. We saw an initial high base structure right there, which broke out to the upside. This previous resistance was used as a new level of support. And then we see the buyers and the bulls yet again push the price above this major level of significance. And we are now holding it for a new level of support. So we do see the price pull back to test this zone yet again. Let's just see where the price around is. I guess 32, 32, we see that right there. But what we're gonna be looking for is validation yet again. This previous daily candle, we did see a wick touch the bottom of the support, which was previous resistance right here. So we've already got a validation of this zone. But we do see that we're coming back and this is gonna be the next uh, potential level of support that we're gonna be looking at. So when we zoom into the smaller time frames, we're gonna be making sure that we understand that around 32, 33, somewhere around there, is gonna be the demand zone that we're going to be seeing for the price within the S&P 500. So when we go on to the four hour chart, we do see very strong level of resistance and we've already got one validation for a level of support. And we can see when we are looking back at the previous timeframes, it's not just one, but we do see some consolidations on previous levels of resistance, which is going to be new levels of support. Oops, let's just get uh, this off, this off, and then we can move it freely and then if we're going to be looking for opportunities we can see we do consolidate but at the end of the day oh don't know uh there we go this is the problem not really a well uh i'm, I'm kind of looking for that double double bottom double top kind of formation where let's just get a snip here we're getting that nice double validation where it could be a double bottom right here. This is the first validation you could argue here, definitely here. And then you see that second validation come in and we see the second touch from the support zone. And then you get a break of the resistance and then you get the momentum to the upside where we've already got that first validation. We're coming in for that second validation. And then the next zone would be around 33, let's say 38, somewhere around there is for the next key level of supply. And we can see back in the historic time frames, it was a previous resistance turn to new level of support. So overall, we do look like it's just pulling back. It's in a correction. And my personal view is that we're going to be looking to hold this support zone, validate it once more, really make sure that buyers are able to step in and hold the price there. And then we're going to be looking to further continue the move to the upside for the S&P 500, which is going to indicate to the rest of the kind of trades that we're looking at that this is going to be a continuation for risk on sentiment or a risk on environment, or we're looking for longs in speculative assets and there's less worry, fear, there's more hope and optimism in the air, uh, just overall in the glo uh, global macro scope of things. So that's going to be what the S&P tells me right now. Going to get a little bit of water and then we're going to jump right into the next index. All right. Let's go to the NASDAQ that is actually breaking below this key level of support, which was a previous level of resistance. A little bit surprising, but we do see, if we are looking at the larger time frames, zooming out on the four hour, we do see a very key level of higher lows, as well as this horizontal zone of support at around 10.5K for the NASDAQ. I'm looking at NQ, which is the futures for the NASDAQ 100. 
but um, that's going to be the next potential key zone that we're going to be looking at somewhere around there for the next level of support. I do not think the, that the NASDAQ is going to be really moving to the downside. I think that this is a little bit more aggressive than the S&P for the pullback, but that doesn't really mean that we're going to be looking for any short exposure or we're going to be shifting our bias for, uh, from risk on to risk off. This is just a normal healthy pullback and the only time that I'd be really a little bit worried for the sentiment and my bias for the sentiment would be if it breaks 10.45 right around there because not only do we complete the head and shoulders but we're also going to be breaking below this ascending zone. So there's a lot of support right around the 10.3 ish range so then if we're going to break that zone there's a high probability of the nasdaq further continuing its momentum to the downside which would be a very risk off move so that's going to be something to look for right now we're definitely still a little bit early for anything like that but it's just something to note if it continues and if the sell pressure becomes more and more aggressive and uh, the NASDAQ starts to break 10.4, especially 10.3, that's gonna be a little bit of a worry that this double top may have confirmed and we can get further downside potential, which would obviously have to shift our bias for more of a conservative approach or an approach where global investors are a little bit worried, fearful, and are looking to store their capital in safe havens or uh, cash, bonds, something along the lines of that. Not gonna be looking at equities if this is really starting to fall to the downside. So that's gonna be my view. Don't really wanna be uh, putting too much of a bias just yet, but 10.4, 10.3 is gonna be where I'm gonna get uh, more interested in shifting my bias. But if it doesn't get down there, I'm just gonna be assuming that this is a pullback and uh, this nice support at around 10.5 is going to hold, if not a little bit higher, because we do see some nice higher lows that could hold the price for kind of a mid-range ascending support zone that is going to hold the price creating higher lows. So there's definitely a lot of demand still in the NASDAQ in my personal view, even though we drop below this significant zone, I don't wanna change my bias until we see some further momentum before I really start to think about uh, changing my bias. Surprisingly, the Russell 2000 actually doing better. So this is the small caps, which are seeing more buy volume compared to the tech stocks in the NASDAQ. So the Russell 2000 usually uh, recently has been a lot less buoyant and a lot less uh, uh, interest from the bulls, whereas the NASDAQ has been extremely bullish. So it's interesting to see that the NASDAQ is a little, a little bit down today, whereas the Russell 2000, which is the small caps, is actually up. So different sectors are seeing different uh, amounts of bid volume, different times, but we do still see the demand from the buyers, from the bulls. So the overall risk sentiment is still risk on in my personal view. Justin says, what are you looking at? So this is the Russell 2000 uh, futures, RTY, or if you're just looking for the equity, it's RUT, RUT. And then we're now going to be looking at the VIX or the volatility index. If you do want to be trading the volatility index, let's say you want to hedge or you just are a short-term day trader, you could look at VIXI or TVIX. Uh, those are the two options that you have for actually trading or have getting exposure uh, in the volatility index. But what we're seeing is a nice fade. We do see a little bit of a bump up, but that's totally nothing to worry about in my personal opinion. We see back in previous fades we do have a little bumps up but overall we're looking for the nice steady move down just getting some water here and then we're basically right at this low that we had back in june of 2020 and kind of where we started this whole move to the upside where we gapped up on february 24th at the very start of this huge move so we can see right here we're at the initial starting point, which we can actually see as a previous resistance back in July 2019. So we're at a pretty pivotal point for the VIX. If we see the VIX fall from this point, that's going to be an extremely bullish opportunity 
for the S&P and overall risk on assets and instruments in my personal view. So what you're looking for, if you're a bull, if you're an optimist, if you're hopeful about the market, in the VIX is something like this. You want to see it die down. You want to see it go lower. You want to see the volatility decrease. Whereas if you are wanting to short the market or you want to see the S&P go down, you want to see these big spikes where you want to see something like this where you see a bottom hit and then you see a big sharp spike in volume and, and in price. So that, that's what you wanna see if you're looking to short the S&P. Um, I personally think that there's a higher probability of moving to the upside for the S&P. So the higher probability for the VIX would just be to continue its fade, slowly moving to the downside like we've seen in many times before. That's gonna be my personal view. We'll see where it actually goes, but um, if the S&P breaks the previous low and their previous resistance at around 3250, 3245, this could spike a little bit higher. And then we got our mid-range zone, which is right around here at around $30. So it could spike from 25 to 30. We don't exactly know how far or how high it'll go, but that's going to be my assumption if we do see the S&P fall below 3245-ish. All right, so that's definitely going to be worrying for crypto if the S&P starts to really fall because there is a pretty positive correlation between the S&P and BTC. And we'll talk about those correlations within the crypto market update a little bit later in this video, but uh, we're just gonna continue on with our global macro update. All right, so this is gonna be, I see the question coming in, we'll answer that question, uh, workout king, here in a very little bit. We're just gonna quickly discuss these global equities here. We're gonna look at the top left, which is gonna be the Japanese stock market index, the Nikkei 225. It's consolidating, not really forming any higher high. It is whole, well, it's a little bit of a higher high, and I guess you could, you could argue it's holding the previous resistance as a new level of support. If you're really looking at it like this, but uh, it's not doing a whole lot. It's in a very, very tight, consolidation and we see this ascending zone which is slowly look like it does look like it is kind of weakening or at least breaking at this point so it's not looking phenomenal we got a pretty strong level of support here at the low in early june right before that fall in early june as well so we'll see where it goes from there but right now it's just consolidating and it goes with a lot of these uh, uh, equities or indexes as well i mean ASX, very similar thing where you got the Australian stock market consolidating. We did form a new high. It is holding that previous low for a new level or previous high is a new level of support. But overall, I'm going to uh, assume that there's a little bit of hesitation and uh, kind of makes sense that the S&P is pulling back. A little bit of risk off during this longer term risk on sentiment move, which is just inevitable. You're going to have these pullbacks and we see the UK's FTSE 100 not really be able to make a new high. So the FTSE 100 is definitely one of the weaker indexes and you can see the things like the DAX is actually very strong relative to the UK's FTSE 100 or the ASX where the previous June high is now going to be holding as a nice new level of support whereas UK did not even reach that and the ASX did not reach that or it reached it but it failed to break it for the ASX. So uh, there's still definitely some bullish sentiment in the air. We're just having a little pullback. Market needs to take a breath, but overall it does look like we're continuing the risk on momentum. All right, so now we're gonna be answering a few questions within the TikTok here. Don't really see anything on the YouTube. So Workout King says, what's your best trading tips? Uh, I could talk about this for all day, um, and I'm not talking like eight hours, I'm talking like 24 hours, I could really talk about this all day, but uh, in short, I don't, I don't wanna make the video too, too long, but I would say a extremely helpful tip that I found very useful if you are starting out to learn how to trade is A, always start with paper trading. Don't risk your money in markets that you don't understand or don't know how to trade, and two, always back test a system before you actually use real money to trade. So a lot of people just open up a chart, you know, they might get a signal from someone or they might just think that 
oh, I've seen other people trade head and shoulders. I've seen other people trade triangles. It must work for me. And without back testing it and without actually knowing what the numbers are coming out of a sample size of let's say 30 to 50 trades, you have no idea what the outcome is. So instead of just assuming that you know how to trade wedges, triangles, head and shoulders, whatever what you could use indicators fibonacci whatever the system and the method that you are using you have to know that it's actually profitable before risking any money in the market so what you need to do is before actually putting any money paper trade see if it's profitable know exactly what the stats are of your trading so what you're going to be looking for is how much are you winning? How much are you losing in terms of win loss? Like is it 50%, 60%, 70%, 40%, whatever it is, right? And those numbers are percentage of wins versus losses. So if you're 70% out of 10 tries or attempts or trades, you would win seven out of them, you'd lose three. Whereas if it's 50, obviously it's 50, 50. And then the other big question is how much are you winning when you win versus how much are you losing when you lose? And that's a lot to do with risk management and patience and letting your winners run when you do have those winners because we're pl playing a game of probabilities. I can't give you a trade and say this is going to be a winner. I have zero edge over a single trade. But what I have edge over is if you give me 30 trades, well then I have a much, much, much higher probability of being able to guarantee you profits, right? Because I know that I have edge over a sample size, over a series of trades. So when you're trading, you have to look at it that way. If you take a loss, if you take a couple losses, it does not matter because you know you've back tested your system. It's completely normal if you're winning 60% of the time, 50% of the time to lose three times in a row. It is very, very common for me at least uh, to lose three times in a row and then have one trade wipe out all those losses and now I'm net positive or break even, something along the lines of that. So you can't let those small losses knock you down because it's a part of the game it's 100 percent a part of trading you have to lose in order to find those big winners um, there's never going to be a point where you can have zero losses and unlimited upside you're gonna have to take those losses there's not much cost in trading um, in terms of uh like expenses there's like a commission and broker fees and carry costs and all that stuff but in terms of actually operating a physical business, like if you open up a bar or restaurant, there's not much of a cost or fees for, for trading. So I view my losses as a part of the expenses, right? It's just what it is. You're going to have to deal with them. You're going to have to make sure that you know how to handle it psychologically as well as be able to handle it via risk management with like the financial side of things. But there's an emotional attachment that comes with losing money as well. So you got to have to be able to overcome it, understand that it's a part of the game, not just objectively, but emotionally, because or there are two different things with that. But um, yeah, in short, th that would be a really good tip for learning how to properly trade is back test it first, know exactly what your stats are. Um, obviously, they're not going to be perfect every single time, but ballpark what are they you should be able to know them off the top of your head and then that will give you the confidence to keep on going when you're in a drawdown when you're actually risking live capital um, and you're able to pull the trigger when you think it's a good opportunity because you've done this two three four hundred times back testing whatever you think that you think uh, is enough for you to get ready but whatever that is you can do that so that's my tip to you obviously there's a lot more but hopefully it gives you a little bit of understanding of um, what you should actually be doing in order to be prepared for the markets because it's not a very easy game. It takes a lot of effort, time, energy, commitment, discipline, patience. But um, if, you're, if you're willing to put in that sweat equity, it will reward you immensely. All right. So um, let's look at the US dollar currency index, this is the strength of the dollar. And we were looking at this 94, 95 zone as this significant, significant level that I wanted to see hold, or at least understand what's happening to that zone because it's a zone of sensitivity. We see back in the previous time, time frames, if we're looking at the two hour, 
we see actually the weekly showed it the best. We see key previous level of resistance. We see back in November 2017, June 2018, then turned to a strong level of support multiple times. And then recently we saw a wick bounce right off it back in March of 2020. So we know that there's a lot of demand at this zone. Now for really getting nitty gritty, we haven't really cracked and held below this low yet, but the momentum is obviously to the downside and we have to respect that. The dollar is weakening, which means that uh, it's definitely risk off, right? If people are driving into the dollar, they're looking for safety. First off, US dollar is a safe haven currency. It is mainly looked at as an investment for global investors when there's fear, uncertainty, worry in the financial markets. Right now, there is risk on opportunity, as well as the fact that yes, people understand about inflation and the currency proliferation that is currently occurring within the globe. So it's like a double whammy for the US dollar uh, for why people don't want it. A, it's a risk on sentiment environment, so people are looking to take on more risk, they have a higher risk tolerance, and they're willing to be more speculative. B, they're printing lots of money, so there is a devaluation of the dollar. And I think more people are understanding that. I think it was a little bit harder, but now with technology and the internet, it is really, really easy to get a solid understanding of many, many things in life without actually having to go to an institution to learn those things. You can learn about personal finance, you can learn about economics, you can learn about accounting, you can learn about taxes. You can learn about a lot of things that school doesn't teach you unless you're specifically going to school for those things absolutely for free. So I think that people understand that, oh shit, we're in a, uh, we're, we're basically in a uh, situation where the monetary policy doesn't really have anything left. They can't lower interest rates. The only thing that they can do is print money or do something along the lines of that quantitative easing, Japan's quantitative and qualitative easing. Whatever they make up a word to use, it's basically expanding the balance sheet, expanding the monetary base, the money supply, and, and taking away value from its citizens. And that money usually does not go towards the citizens. It goes towards huge conglomerates, huge corporations, and they get the bailouts. They get the best deal because they get the freshly printed, nice, warm, toasty, out of the oven money. And the citizens get what you call the trickle-down effect where the money has already been diluted into the economy by the time the actual mom-and-pop individual receives it, their value of the dollar is already decreased due to the increase in the supply. So it's a rigged system where huge corporations get the freshly printed money which has the most value and when it circulates and by the time it circulates through the economy, it's obviously going to dilute it and people are going to be losing value. But everyday individuals, not the huge corporations, they will survive because this is how the framework is set up to be, is to funnel money into the huge corporations. So, a little bit of unfortunate news, but uh, that's my personal view. So in short, moving to the downside, we see massive wicks to the upside indicating sell pressure driving the dollar further down, weakening it even more. And we can see that within the metals. So metals had a massive bullish push. Uh, caught a decent amount of it for silver, but didn't catch all of it. Really wishing that I would have maybe put a trailing stop, but uh, you know what it is. Can't really guarantee anything. There's no real... Um, there's always going to be something that you could have done better in a trade, which is just how trading is, but um, you can't really complain about completely executing your trade plan to the T. That is something that you should be proud of no matter what because you are conducting uh, your own analysis, your own trade plan, you're creating it and then you're executing it. You can't really argue about that. So the next key level of support I think is going to be around 94. So we'll see what our goes from there. But uh, it's just from this descending channel when it melted down, it's just been on a massive really capitulation down where you see huge drop, massive rejection, another massive rejection. I think we're going to get more sell pressure for the US dollar in my personal opinion. 
And then we can see within the currency side of things a little bit surprising. So if we're going to really zoom in, we see the Australian dollar really well. We see GBP, UK's currency do really well. And then we also see things that are more safe havens start to pick up. The two safe havens that I'm looking at for currencies that have been doing better than things like the United States dollar and the Japanese yen would be Euro and the Swiss franc. So right now, JPY, Japanese yen and USD is by far the weakest currencies and they're very correlated. So if we do shift into a semi risk off, I think a risk off versus risk off where you're comparing the relatively strong risk on and you're longing the, the relatively strong one and showing the weak one would be a pretty good opportunity because we're in a point where in my view it's still risk on sentiment but we're getting a pullback a little bit of worry in the market just because we're seeing red but they're not too big a worry worry we're nearing a support zone but we do see the risk on currencies, Australian dollar, GBP go down. So I think if we're looking at opportunities, you know, CHF long for potentially USD short, JPY short, or Euro long with USD or JPY short. So that's kind of my FX plays that I'm looking at potentially just in terms of the fundamental side of things. So. We'll see where it goes, but right now we're definitely getting a bit of a move down. Bears are winning the battle a little bit, and bonds are really not doing a whole lot, so there's not a whole lot to talk about in that department. All right, uh, let's just quickly look at the TikTok comments, and then we're going to jump right into silver, which is uh, the metal that has been doing unbelievably well. All right, so Workout King says, thanks. How would you recommend us to get a good strategy just trying out a new strategy? There are there are so many different strategies. Um, it depends on what you're looking for. I personally don't love using a lot of indicators. Like I don't use MACD, RSI, ADX, Stochastics, Bollinger Bands. Uh, even like FIBS is a tool. It's not really an indicator. I don't really use FIBS too much. Sometimes I use for a specific strategy. I do use a FIB, but for 95% of my trading, I don't use FIBs or, or almost any indicators. I'll sometimes use moving averages for potentially a take profit strategy. So instead of structuring the take profit, so I raise it every, every single time, it creates and validates a previous resistance as a new level of support on a long, for example, I would use a 20 period moving average and then I would just take the profit or move the stop loss up with the 20 period moving average until it hits my stop loss. Like there are different ways. And what you do is if you're paper trading, you would put in, a, in an Excel sheet how much you would have made, how much you would have lost with different, for example, take profit methods. So then over this large sample size, you have a really good understanding of what method works the best. What method is going to give you the highest amount of money risking the least amount of money that is the goal of trading you're, you're trying to make the most amount of money you can with the least amount of risk as possible on any given trade so you're trying to find methods and systems that allow you to capture more profit while minimizing your losses and you could it, it's kind of like imagination really but uh, that's kind of what we do as well is we we do provide education for setups structures what we trade, how we trade them, how to how to back test them, how to write them in Excel, so it's more informative than just a simple take profit entry. How many how many percentages, how many percentage points you moved up or pips or whatever it is. Um, so we do provide that just to let you know. Um, next one says, Krista says. Increasing the wealth gap, you know, make rich, you know, make rich people richer. Yeah, so talking about the inflation, that's definitely true. When governments print money, they have done bail-ins, they have done payment programs uh, or paycheck programs in the U.S. as well as Canada, as well as other parts of the world. 
but generally speaking, if there's a bailout, there's going to be a bailout for large corporations, not individuals. And those corporations, like we saw back in 2009, 2010, pretty unbelievable stuff happened. Like banks collapsed, Bear Stearns, Lehman Brothers, and, and what happened, right? You would think that people would be furious with these bankers, but no, uh, they received a shit ton of money freshly printed and what did they do with it? Uh, they didn't give it to the individuals who lost money through the collapsed banks. No, they gave themselves bonuses. They got record bonuses that year. H how is that even possible? Th this is cr criminality at its best, really, like, like, like white collar criminality. But that's the world we live in. So just being aware of it is definitely a huge positive and... I think one day it'll change, but uh, there's going to be a pretty big revolution that needs to occur before it changes because bankers really don't rule the world, but they have a tremendous amount of power. Huge amount of power. Central banks and commercial banks have a tremendous amount of power. So, it you know, they have vested interests. They're doing well. They're profiting from this. They're the one benefiting from the current structure and society that we live in. Why would they want to change it? They wouldn't want to change it at all. They want things to remain exactly the same. So it'll be difficult, but I think change is inevitable. So I think there's a positive out there. Um, you know, the last, in economics, you do see the increase in the wealth gap, but nothing lasts forever. So I think sometime in our lifetime, there will be a closing of that wealth gap to some degree. Um, but you never know, right? You, you never know. But then also when you do think about it, I did watch this do documentary where the more advanced an economy is, the greater the wealth gap, which makes sense because if you have an extremely useful service and it's very advanced and, and you kind of have a monopoly, kind of like what Amazon does, uh, you're going to have a huge revenue source and you're going to be able to fill a lot of issues within an economy for e-commerce that was amazon right and and that will create and generate a tremendous amount of wealth and it, it's in my opinion rewarded for the ingenious hard-working talented disciplined patient individual that was able to create a huge corporation like Amazon. Not saying he treats his workers right and, and you know where he's gone now, but in terms of the effort that he's put in, um, you should be compensated for the effort that you put in because if you're dedicating your entire life to something and you're only going to get paid minimum wage, would you do it? You definitely wouldn't. So let's go back to uh, the gold and silver chart here. Gold on an absolute roar. Uh, we do see the gold and silver chart pull back here and I said I'm in waiting for some level of correction, some continuation pattern and it looks like it is slowly forming and we can form something that uh, is giving us a potential opportunity to further our continuation for uh, to carry the momentum on this particular pair. Don't really see a nice ascending zone, it'd be nice to see something like this, like an ascending triangle formation but we don't really see that on the four hour or any real small time frame. When we go to, when you go to the daily, we do see this strong level right here where we already indicated pretty important level. We can see back it was a support, turn into support, resistance, support, resistance. So when we go back over here, we've got to understand that there's going to be a pretty strong level of resistance. So it makes sense. So we don't really see anything that is uh, too great right now. You can draw in a possible horizontal zone or a little bit of a slight descending zone. I'm just gonna draw in this zone right here. I'm gonna delete these just because I already know that there's a lot of supply here, which makes sense, indicated by these big wicks. And you see this mid-range zone right around here. And then I'm also gonna be adding in just one more at the bottom here, just in case if it does go all the way down to this range, that wouldn't be a bad opportunity because then we could be looking at potentially doing something like this where you're going to get a squeeze in structure. So it's nice to see that the price is able to now consolidate and hold and we're now going to get a continuation pattern. So 
we're going to be looking at this. I don't really see an entry right now. It's definitely really, really early in the formation of really anything. Um, the closest thing I'll be able to see is something like this, like an ascending triangle formation. That would be the closest thing that I'd like really to, to see, but um, we'll see where it goes. We still would like to see it validate one more time with this zone. And then what we would be looking for, so let's get this. Maybe something like this. Because sometimes you do have ascending zones that break, still hold that and then continue. But what you would be looking for is this, this validation. And then the stop loss is below the previous low. You could do the size of this, just eyeballing. It's probably gonna be like 2.8, we don't exactly know. But um, that's like the only real option that I currently see right now for silver. If that's not really a great play, if it doesn't form a nice structure, I'll just leave it and wait for another opportunity. So I'll just leave this trend line there. But uh, what I'm mainly looking at is just these horizontal zones and the possibility of a continuation pattern. I'm looking for triangles and wedges. Those are the two continuation patterns that I like trading most. So I'm going to be looking for those in particular. Right now, like I said, gold and silver ratio is going up, which means that uh, silver is going to be moving down a little bit more than gold, which is totally not a bad thing because we do need some consolidation. So gold's on an absolute roar, basically just hitting under 1900. Massive move from 1815. Huge. Like, wow. My God. <laughs> it's crazy. Um. So yeah, like silver, I'm looking for that nice pause and a continuation. We look like we're not really seeing that much more aggression, a little bit of slowdown from the two corrections and a wick up, but, uh, and we see less volume come in, but what I'm looking for is just a nice little slope down, kind of maybe something like this. Let's go here. So we are near a pretty significant zone at around 1900. We have to understand that. So what we're looking for is some continuation structure sort of like this. Like for example, this would be a nice triangle formation and then you'd be looking to enter right around here and then breaking of that zone. That would be something that we would be looking for. But right now um, on the two hour chart, don't really see anything. I personally like to mainly stick on the one hour or two hour chart for execution and entry. And you know, there was some nice high basis. So that's a, oops, that's a base right there where you have previous resistance support twice, resistance twice, and you have validation. So that could be an entry for a move up there. But at this point, um, you could just say very, very simply test of a previous resistance into a new level of support. But how close it is to the $1,900 zone, I'd rather just patiently wait and wait for the next opportunity. I already uh, did really well on silver, so I don't really need to try to squeeze out more here. Um, just the risk reward is not there in my personal opinion for gold as of right now. We've got to wait for a better structure, a valid price action pattern that gives us an edge in trading in the markets. If we're just randomly entering, that's not trading, that's gambling, right? So we have to have specific set of criteria that we're able to use in order to have the same approach to trading the markets every single time. So we need to have a structured way to approach no matter what market it is, which we have, which is very helpful. So I think the only reason crude oil is kind of going up a little bit is just because how bad the US dollar is falling if this was completely stationary, this is what it would be doing. It'd actually be going up more because the US dollar is actually going down. So it's not doing much in terms of consolidations. Like you can see right here, we're still holding this resistance zone. But we did break to a new high. That is definitely something that uh, we do have to consider. So right here, this was the previous resistance we did 
pass it and we're now holding that zone as a new level of support so structurally speaking we are actually moving to the upside and we can see a nice little support zone held there as well so you could say that this is an ascending triangle that recently broke out if we're just taking this and restructuring it that looks a lot more bullish so it is in line with the overall sentiment because we are saying risk on which makes sense so the overall bias for oil is going to be to the upside as well. But I am going to draw in my ascending zone. Just because of the fact that um, I want to know where a possible level of resistance is going to be. So I'm going to put that at the anchor point with the type B candle closure, make it red. And then we got the nice ascending zone right there. So that's going to be where the possible next key zone is. It's just going kind of in a channel right now, but it's definitely, in my opinion, has a higher probability of moving to the upside than to the downside as of right now. So that's my analysis on WTI crude oil. I think the possibility, the highest possibility is as long as we're holding the support for it to hold this resistance as a new level of support and then reach that high right there. So that's what I would be looking for for WTI crude oil in my personal view. Well, the SPX does look like it is falling at a decent rate here. All right, so that's going to be the commodities. Let's close that off. And let's now go to BTC. Going to get a little bit of water. Also, if you have any questions, drop them in the comments. And I'll be able to help you out. All right, so we're now gonna be going to the next thing, which is BTC, so let's open this up here. We do have to understand the overall global markets when we are looking at crypto because they all do kind of come together here. So let's go off the daily chart. Actually, let's go to the weekly because we don't always talk about that. Still a very, very important chart. So what I did is everyone puts their trend line at the top there, which definitely works. But what I did is I used this previous support as then a new level of resistance. Uh, we can do that with trend lines. We can do that with horizontal zones of sensitivity. And I just chose to do it because it does fit the price action a little bit more clear in my personal view. So we still know that there's a lot of heavy resistance here. We don't want to assume that BTC is going to fully break out uh, as well as because the SMP is not really at an extremely bullish point just yet. We need a lot of pressure for this to break around 10K. And in my personal view, yes, BTC has broken out and it has been a lot more bullish, but I still don't want to call it a breakout. It has broken above this previous high, right? Which I said was the previous high we're looking for. And it has broken. But um, with the current overall market not related just to crypto but looking at the SMP looking at currencies looking at metals I think we could see a little bit of a slight pullback or hesitation which in my opinion I don't really want to be holding something that's just going sideways it is stepping up so let's dive into it let's just objectively look at BTC and not consider uh, all the different asset classes. So on the weekly chart, we do see we still haven't broken the $9,700 zone, which is a major level of resistance for BTC. We also see around 10.4 is, but the key, the key level for the weekly chart, we can see lots of candle closures at the $9,700 zone. So that's going to be the main level that I'd like to see the candle close above in order for me to confirm the continuation to the upside. And then when we are zooming on to the daily here, let's just expand this. We can see that we have broken above this high right here and validated it for a new level of support. So the $9,500 zone is broken, which is a very significant area within our structure. Next zone we are testing is right here. But um, as it creeps up here, it just looks like it's uh, potentially going to break out to the upside. I was thinking that it would break down for a while just because where it is on the weekly chart just looks like there's more room for the downside than there is for the upside but with how the current market is going i would say 
making an attempt to look long BTC, I think for the expansion volatility come would actually not be a bad idea. And the thing is, in this circumstance, you can take two attempts because the risk reward would probably be very high because you're going to get that expansion if, as long as you let it run. You're going to get those really solid winners. So right now, what I'm kind of looking at is, do we make an attempt, right? That, that is the big question because alts have been running. Right now, they're consolidating a little bit, but um, they do look pretty good. So it's just a big question is, is Bitcoin going to be starting to expand its volatility? Because we can see... This is the volatility chart. We usually stick to the daily, but we can see it is moving to the upside here. And the big question is, are we going to see these big rips like we saw back in November of 2018 and April of 2019? If that's the case, we want to be looking to really, really get an entry on BTC because it's going to be a very big move and we don't want to miss it. We've only had two other times where volatility was this low. And both times made an extremely aggressive move after the volatility contracted. When it started to expand, we got a massive move. So we're going to be looking for some level of exposure, either to the downside or upside, depending on which way it's going to go. Right now, it looks like it is moving to the upside, which uh, is really great to see. Obviously, it's going to be great for the overall crypto space, as well as our investments. And if we're able to catch a good trade, that would be good as well. So... Now that we understand the direction and the two key levels, we'll look for possible entry points using the Bitfinex chart on the two hours. So we'll go here, zoom out a little bit, make that a little bit cleaner, make it white. And then we're gonna go on this zone as well. And then we're gonna go on the top zone because we just have to understand where the main levels are right around there that one's going to be a little bit larger somewhere around there and then i'll even do little price labels so we got 90 let's say 9 we got 97 and 94 80. Right now we're testing 97 coming to 97 came from 9480. Very structurally well respected zone for 9480 here. Let's just bring them a little bit closer so we can see the three zones, what we're talking about. Lots of volume, that is for sure. Wow. I'm just looking at the SMP as well, because the SMP is falling right now, but BTC is moving up, which is a little bit interesting. What we're going to do is pull up the correlations here and see if they're going to go negative, because that would be great to see the correlations start to turn for BTC. Yeah, not bad. Okay. So this is Bitcoin compared with the SMP 500. We can see on the 360 day chart, not really correlated at around 0.1. So there is some positive correlation, but not a whole lot. We know that zero is absolutely no correlation. And we're just kind of going from negative 0.1 to 0.1. So there's not a huge amount of correlation, although right now we do see some positive correlation, although it's very slight in 360 days. When we are jumping to the 180 day, that's when things get a lot more correlated, where we can see that the correlation has increased quite substantially within the last kind of handful of months here. We went from zero correlation, no correlation at all between traditional markets like the S&P 500 and BTC to then we're at basically almost an all time high of correlation where we're at 0.25, 0.26 within 180 days, which means out of 100%, meaning Bitcoin's 100% with 100% correlated with Bitcoin, we can see that Bitcoin is 25% correlated with the S&P, positive. So that's not great to see if you want 
the stock market to go down and Bitcoin to go up. But if you think that Bitcoin and stock market are both considered risk on assets that are in the same basket to some level of degree, that would be a positive thing if you want both of them to go up. So let's go to the 90 day chart and zoom out to the entire chart and then just go like this. We can see that within the last 90 days, there is decreasing positive correlation, which is great to see because in my view, I think that Bitcoin is going to, and, and just general crypto is going to be more favoring what the metals are doing to some degree, where they're going to be looked at as a store of value later on or a safe haven during monetary uncertainty in economies. Look at Venezuela, look at Zimbabwe, what happened, right? Where did they turn to? Yes, they did turn to the US dollar because it's the world reserve currency. But what if the world reserve currency is inflating? Where do you turn, right? You can look for safe haven assets like gold and silver, which has historically done very well. But in this digital age where we use credit cards, phones, and rarely use physical items to actually exchange value, where is the money going? My personal belief is going to be cryptocurrencies. So I think that when there is the worry of inflation, monetary uncertainty is hitting individuals in an economy and the proliferation of currency is catching up to the value of the dollar, meaning the value of the value of the dollar is going to be falling or collapsing. That's when people are really going to be diving into crypto in my personal belief. Um, Totino, how's it going? Kevy, let's go. Yeah, let's do it. Yeah, definitely want that separation. TY says Zord it. And he said, yep. All right. So that's going to be a little bit of discussion on the overall correlations. So let's go to the four hour to discuss, see what we're able to find. So let's just quickly look at the SP because the SP is falling quite quickly here on the other exchange. So we see volatility increase substantially. We see the NASDAQ continue its descent. We see the Russell 2000 start shifting and look at the S&P, right? It's falling below that support that we're looking for. I don't know if it will. We got around two, let's say two hours and 45 minutes until this four hour candle closes. Let's look at the one hour really quickly. The one hour is still 46 minutes from closing. This could just be a wick down. We don't know. I don't really like to go under the one hour chart for candle closures, we are using structural zones. So if we do see the one hour close with a wick down, that would indicate that buyers are still present in the market, still adding pressure to keep the price above a certain zone. But if we do see the price close above this 30 to 30 zone, 30 to 40 zone, that could indicate a potential shift in market sentiment where the risk on opportunities or trades are not going to be looking as favorable and things that are more safe, I guess you could say, uh, in the perspective of global investors, things like bonds, things like the US dollar, Japanese yen, those types of assets are probably going to be doing pretty well. So that's going to be the environment um, that we could be looking at if it does break, but we'll see where it goes from here. All right, so going back to crypto. So we discussed a little bit of BTC. We'll discuss a little bit more. It's going to be pretty dependent on the S&P. It'd be nice to see BTC uh, fall back to around the 9480 zone and retest this zone and validate it once more. That would be a good opportunity. And then if we do see the S&P hold the support and overall global uh, sentiment does not change, it's still risk on. That, in my opinion, would be a decent opportunity because we do see structural zones of sensitivity in the prior price action within the 94.87 to 94.90 zone. So that could be an opportunity. We'll see where it goes. The S&P is going to be a big determiner of that possible opportunity. Um, if it does continue moving to the upside, the next zone is 97. We do see very strong level of resistance right around here. Could be a new level of support in the momentum to the upside. If we do pass this zone, that's going to be a really big factor because we see the price really validate that it's climbing, making higher highs and higher lows. And it is aggressively pushing up, kind of speeding up as it's moving to the upside. 
Uh, you're not ideally wanting to see something like this. We're getting like a slowdown where you can see some convexi convexity. You want to see concave where you're seeing like this, where you're seeing a parabolic aggressive move. And that's kind of what we're seeing right now, which is really good. So that's going to be my view. That's basically the only opportunity that I currently see right now because this is a symmetrical triangle. Definitely, it's still a breakout. I'm just a little bit worried when we do zoom back to the larger time frames like here. This is what worries me about a long because we do see some very heavy resistance coming through right around here. That's not very far away. So you got some opportunity, yes, but longing right into kind of the heaviest resistance that Bitcoin has might not be the best. Um, I would say the more dependable opportunity would be to wait. Uh, but then you're just basically anticipating that there will be some sort of continuation pattern at around like 10, 5, 10, 6, 10, 7. Uh, somewhere around there where we see this resistance and this resistance possibly create some level of support that we might get a wedge, that we might get a triangle, something along the lines of that. That would be the more dependable opportunity if you are looking to long BTC in my personal view. Already talked about the volatility shifting a little bit, so we'll see where it goes. Um, we do see that it is moving up. When we go on to the four hour, we do see that it is breaking resistance and uh, just really on a move to the upside. So the volatility of Bitcoin is shifting. It's just a matter of which way we want to be patient, but we do want to be looking for exposure. So um, we'll see where it goes from here. I will be doing a video tomorrow. So we'll see in another 24 hours what happens to the price action. All right, so that's going to be my view of the BTC charts. Let's just zoom out a little bit and see the total two making a strong move. Altcoins really breaking out and we'll take a look at the altcoins a little bit later. But yeah, definitely we want to be looking at altcoins right now because we know for a fact that altcoins are doing well and they're relatively stronger than BTC. And we can see a little bit of discussion on the market cap for the BTC dominance, it is going down where Bitcoin dominance is decreasing, which means that there is capital funding, funneling out of Bitcoin and funneling into altcoins, which is more speculative, which is what we're looking for. Okay, so Cardano, let's just discuss what we've already covered here in the previous video. VeChain has not broken out, Cardano has not broken out. Stellar has broken out, but it hasn't been nearly as relatively strong as Link. So that's why I chose Link personally. So we see, let's just zoom this one out right here. I got a stop entry above the previous high. So it triggered me in when the momentum started to move to the upside. Stop loss is above the previous low. Take profit is the size of the descending wedge. Is a first take profit at risk reward of around 2.4. So that's going to be the trade that we're at right now. Entry at $8, stop loss 7.63. Uh, 8.87 is the first TP that we're going to be aiming for for this possible trade for an initial 2.4 RR. So we'll see where it goes from there. But that's my alt that we're playing right now. Adam didn't really play out. This is Adam. Didn't really want to enter. It got really noisy. Didn't really form any nice structure. That was an extremely large rejection that I was very unhappy with. So I didn't want to really fiddle around with it. Algo is failing to break the 0.36 zone that we talked about. So really the only opportunity that I currently see right now is Link. Although if you, let's just zoom in to the relative strength. All, right now, Ethereum is really the only thing that's doing well. Um, Link's holding, which is good. Things that are also kind of moving up. XCC is okay. Zill. But then the further you move back, just looking to see what's up here. Not a lot, really. Ethereum is doing really well. Link's doing really well. And that's kind of about it. Um, that's kind of mainly why I chose Link. Ethereum already kind of made its move, whereas Link, I still think, has yet to make its move. And that's why I'm cho I chose this one. So that's basically going to be the overall discussion for the cryptocurrency market. We'll see where it goes. A uh, little bit of movement. Got a nice a little bit of exposure on Link because I think the risk on momentum will continue. And that's why I have my pair chosen and entered, but we'll see where it goes. So that's going to be the overall analysis for today. Hopefully you enjoyed it. If you have any questions, drop them in the comment section below and uh, I'll be able to answer them from there. So I'm just going to keep this just like that.
And uh, I think that is the completion of the video. So thank you very much for watching. I really appreciate it. It was about an hour, which is a good amount of time to be uh, making these videos. If you enjoyed it, if you thought it was useful, helpful, beneficial, informative, educational, it'd be great if you would like the video. It does help us out. And it would be great if you would subscribe, if you would like to get more videos like this, because we do provide these global macro updates every weekday for you for absolutely free. Um, and we'll continue to do so as long as you kind of find it useful and give it a thumbs up. And if you subscribe, it lets us know that we should continue making videos like this. So thank you very much for watching. Until next time, have a good one, everyone.